Hello again, fans of the old and obscure in Wargaming. Today we're back with some more Clan War, and I've been asked to show how to play the game. So I've set up a demonstration game with about 1,200 points worth of troops on each side. On this side, we've got the Scorpion with Ninja Bowman, Black Cabal, Crimson Legion, and over there, the Scorpion Strike. Okay. On this side, we've got the Crab Berserkers. Some archers. We've got uh, the damned and some Hida house guard, led by a character. And I'm just going to try to walk you through the game, uh, show you some of the basic mechanics, and give you an idea of how to play the game. So, what you need to play first of all, miniatures and terrain. They don't have to be painted. You'll need your tactical card decks. Thirty cards each. You get to make those one per army, and you're gonna need dice, 10-sided dice, lots of them. I've already put out some dice to show uh, for initiative. Uh, we need a tape measure, and I got some markers here. I use these basically for uh, broken, routed, and then for special effects. You're going to want to have some army lists. I'm using the Army Builder 2.2C that has all the stats that you need. I'll give you one caveat about the Army Builder, though the victory point levels on them are a little funny. Uh, you score victory points in this game, uh, one for every hundred points and uh, or portion thereof. So um, Some of these might look a little wonky if you look at the Huruma archers for example, there's 12 of them uh, And the total unit cost is 212 including the leadership package. I think that might be what throws it off um, So that should be a three victory point unit if you wipe them out, but it says if you kill seven you get one VP 13 to kill two so it kind of implies that you'd only get two because you could never get to 19 in a unit of 12 but if you see they're worth 212 points, that's going to be three points uh, if you kill them. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the Army Builder overall is really good. I'm really glad to have it, but there's a couple of quirks there in that victory point system. Uh, it also defines a lot of the uh, special rules that are in the Army that you choose, which is really useful. And uh, can give you the total points and a percentage breakdown if you're curious. In this one, I've pretty much stuck to the traditional one quarter of your points on personality, so that was lucky. So I have one for the scorpion and one for the crab. Uh, you're going to want to have your rule book, which I've gone through before in detail. But I printed out the reference sheet, which has the turn sequence summary right there. We're going to be consulting that quite a bit. And uh, I did go ahead and actually on my own made up a common clan war modifier sheet. Uh, all of these sheets are available on the Facebook group, which there's a link to uh, in the comments here. But um. There wasn't anywhere that really summarized um, a lot of the most common modifiers to the dice uh, included. So, and then also void spends, which are a big deal. I've summarized them here as well. So you can get all of those at the uh, Clan War Facebook group if you're interested. Um, but let's go ahead and dive right in. So, as we've said, Clan War is an alternating activation game. And the first thing that we're going to do is do the initiative phase. So players are going to roll a die for each of the units that they control, and the result will be modified by their commander's battle skill. You can also use initiative focus cards or the general's modifier. And the modified result is the modified initiative score for the unit, and then they activate in according to their MIS score. So let's take a look at how this would work for the crab, for example. The crab berserkers are led by a personality, Hida Amaro. He has battle two. So when we roll for his unit, that's a 10, that would be give us an interesting ad roll there. But uh, we'll say if he rolled like a three or a four, we could either add two to make it a six or we could subtract two to make it a two. And the lower you are in your initiative, um, the earlier you go. So higher is slower, lower is faster. If you do roll a 10 in this game, there are lots of add rolls. So we rolled a 10. If you roll for an initiative, you can roll it again and then decide to either add or subtract that. So from here, I could go to 17 with my original roll of 10. I can go to 17 or I could go down to 3. So let's say I go down to 3. Now, one other thing you can do is after you've rolled for all of your units, so let's just say for the sake of argument, these guys all have battle 2. These guys will end up, let's say we want to go fast. They're going to go 1, right? I'm going to put them at three. We can go into the negatives here. There's no limits, negative or positive. 
Uh, let's make them a four. And this, by the way, I'm using is the Hand of Fate. It's a little gift from Makabe, Japan, when I visited there. The Hand of Fate determines who has the tiebreaker role. And we'll give them a four. Okay, so now we've set up all of our units with their modified initiative score, but we also have the General's um, Battle Skill, which uh, in Amuro's case, I believe, Aramoro. I've unfortunately picked a bunch of characters that have very similar names. Bayushi Aramoro has a battle of three, so he could further modify the initiative of any unit on the table by another three. So let's just say for the sake of argument, oh, you know what? I actually want them to go faster. I'm going to use his battle skill for the general to bring these guys back down to a one. And then I've done that. So that's your modified initiative step. And you do that for both sides, okay? Once you're done with the modified initiative score, you've finished the initiative phase. You'll go to special actions phase. Now you take turns with the highest modified initiative score going first, uh, to do special abilities and special orders. Okay, so in this case, um, if you wanted to, for example, use Bayushi Aramoro's ability, uh, which can be to uh, make an enemy discard a card from their hand, uh, if you discard a card, you would do that right now. And whoever had the highest initiative score would go first. Or if you had a special ability... Um, in one of your units that allowed them to use a tattoo. If they were a dragon, for example, you would do that now. Uh, or if you had a character like uh, this gentleman, Marmo, who once per game, he can allow your unit to have the cavalry trait. You would say, okay, Marmo is gonna do that now. Or sorry, Marmo. <laughs> I really should have gotten guys with different names. That's the special actions phase. And you're gonna take turns. Um, you can only do one special order or special action from each source, unless there's a special rule otherwise. So, for example, if the Cabal had a special order of their own, they could use it, and then he could use it, his. Okay. Um, but that's it for the unit, unless there's a special rule that says otherwise. Once you've done that, you're going to go to the primary movement phase. So in the primary movement phase, uh, units that are not spent can perform movement and you can perform appropriate maneuvers and enter an engagement. So in the primary movement phase, we are going to go in order of initiative, lowest to highest. So let's say, for example, they're a one. What if the house guard were also a one? Well, whoever held the hand of fate would say uh, how to break that tie. So let's say the scorpion here have the hand of fate, and they're going to say, okay, you can go ahead, crab. I want you to go first. Well, the crab's going to move. Uh, most of the units in this game have a speed of four inches, right? So we're going to go ahead and measure out our four inches. Right. Without too much ado, we're going to say it's about to there. Put my finger out of there and scooch them up. Now, in your primary movement phase, you get one free maneuver. So I could also, if I wanted to, start to wheel. So let's say these guys are going to go across that bridge. They're going to do their four inches. Let's say that's four inches away. Measuring from the corner, the other corner stays still. They will hinge like that. You can do a partial wheel and then go forward. Now there's all kinds of free maneuvers that you can do. And three maneuvers always have to be simple. So here there's a list of maneuvers that you can do. Contracting and expanding is simple, right? Um, turning about is simple. Turning left to right is simple. Wheeling is simple. And even if it's complex requires a maneuver check. So, for example, if I wanted to do a full retreat, I would have to make an immediate morale check to pass that and then turn and make a full move uh, four inches away. Uh, so, sorry, that was a bad example. That's uh, that's not something that requires training because that's just running away. Uh, so let's say I'm going to do something cool. Um, the Haruma withdrawal is a complex reactionary movement defense required. So let's say um, I was about to be charged and I wanted to move back. So with these guys, I would make a training level check. So how does that work? Well, let's go back to our sheet. 
Um, we're looking at Crab Heavy Elite. They have a training level of six, and they're led by Hida Tampako. We don't look at his training level, but we do look at his leadership. So there are six to start. Remember that rolling high is good in this game. The three will bring us down to a three or better. And then we'll say, okay, do they make it? Three, yes. So they could make their Haruma withdrawal and withdraw. Uh, if they fail, then generally speaking, nothing happens. Um, when you have complex interactions like um, running away, like that full retreat, uh, if you fail, then you um, could become uh, broken. So there's definitely some possible consequences to that. But there's the maneuver list. Those are the things that you can do in the primary movement phase. So let's just say all our guys move. Because at this point in the game, it's not going to be too relevant. And you'll find that in your games of Clan War, usually the first couple turns are maneuvering. Uh, one of the reasons as a house rule that I like to have my units set up 12 inches onto the board rather than 8, uh, which is what the rule book says, because you get into the action a bit faster, and so far I haven't seen that it really prejudices the game much. These guys will move up to the edge of the wheat field. And as we go around, what did we say we are going to do here? Yeah, so these guys did a wheel, and they're going to move about three inches. Let's say these guys here are going to do a right face, and maybe think about going across that ford. So when they um, take a simple maneuver, um, that's going to go ahead and cost them uh, movement to do that. And so they will be um, reduced by minus one inch for performing a maneuver test. Otherwise, um, making maneuver test reduces the unit's movement by one inch for the phase. Okay. So then they would have another three. Assuming this isn't rough train, we'll call it a Ford. They're going to move three inches onto the Ford. Okay, the Haruma Archers. Now, here's another interesting thing we could do. The Haruma Archers are probably going to want to shoot. Now, a unit of Archers wants to be in Archers Row so that they can have two ranks to shoot. And they're probably just about in range of the bad guys already. So they're going to make a maneuver check as well to engage in Archers Row. Okay, Archers Row is not listed on this maneuver list, but it is a standard maneuver. They can do it for free. And so once again, we're going to take a maneuver test to see if they can do that. Now, if you had a parade ground practice card in your hand, that would be a good time to use it. So looking at these guys, they have a training level of six. They are led by a crab gun, so with a leadership of two. So they need a four better to perform Archer's Row. They would fail, and they would stay. However, we're going to say that they passed so that I can show you Archer's Row. So assuming they passed then you would change the formation of the unit to show that they passed the test. And the way you do Archer's Row is they simply slot over the rear rank. Okay, and so that you've got a guy in between. Now they can't move at this point other than that. They are in a, what's called a, uh, a non-standard formation or special formation. And uh, other than shooting, they will be at a minus one to all their rolls. All right, the Berserkers, they are definitely going to move forward. Now, in this game, you basically want to stay away from terrain if you can, because it's going to be an additional inch for every inch traveled through terrain. Uh, let's just say the wheat field doesn't actually have an effect here. That is simple enough. But the rest of our people have to deal with some river crossings and bridges and such. Okay, that would be our primary movement phase. And um, after our primary movement phase, we would have cavalry movement phase. But we don't have any cavalry on the table right now. Um, this guy has a special ability that if uh, he wanted to, he could make this unit cavalry. Maybe we'll save that for later. Okay. What happens once we're done with primary movement, then cavalry movement, as I said, then range attack phase. Units that possess range attacks may select enemy targets and resolve their attacks. Casualties are resolved simultaneously. All right, so now let's have some fun. Um... You have to fire at the closest unit unless you've got a special card or ability that allows you to do otherwise. Now, interestingly, there's no pre-measuring in this game. So, 
we're looking at the archers there and these guys here. I would say these guys are closer, but um, you can go ahead and say to your opponent, look, I'm not really sure who's the closest. And I'm not trying to pre-measure, but I think it's these guys. And I'll say, okay, let's see if it actually is. And you measure from the center. All right. So what do we got here? We're looking at about 23 to them. But you know what? Let's double check over here. This is actually 22. So I have all that wrong. All right. And if we're playing with friends, we're not going to get upset about it. Um, they're going to have to fire at those guys. The Crimson Legion. So how does shooting work? All right. The Haruma Archers... Uh, they get one strike each shooting, unless there's some special rule, like there may be some personalities or whatnot. Generally speaking, you get one dice per shooting. There are 12 of them, and they are in Archer's Row, which means they'll get all their dice. If they were in one row, they would only get the front rank, but they're going to get two ranks of firing. So I'm going to need 12 dice. Let's grab a bunch of dice. And you will see what an attack roll looks like in Clan War. Hope you get enough 10-sided dice if you're going to play this game. You're going to need some. Okay. Looks like 12. Okay, well. Um, how are we going to shoot at these guys? Okay, well, first thing we need to know is what is their attack target number? The Crimson Legion, unfortunately for them, are only a 6. Nothing real special about that. Uh, then we're going to look at the range. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that it's over 15 inches range so it's going to be at long range for these archers let's take a look back at their sheet here they have a yumi 15 inches is their regular uh regular range close sorry 30 inches extended so if it's over 15 they have a minus two extended range is always minus two to hit so we're going to take that six right the crimson legion's atn of six and we're going to say you have a minus two to hit them. Um, but then the Haruma archers have a plus one. Okay, so now um, ordinarily you need sixes. But now uh, because of that minus two, you're going to need eights. This brings it back down to seven. And then uh, because we move, it's another minus two. So that's going to bring us back to nines. So let's look at that again. Ordinarily it's a six. It's minus two for range and minus two for having moved. So that's a 10, but they're a plus one to hit. That's a nine. I'll roll these dice. Gonna need nines to hit. Nines to hit. That would have been an awful roll. They would have got nothing. All right, let's just say for the sake of argument, we got a few nines. We got a few hits. Okay, so all these would miss. We got two regular hits, and we got a 10. What does a 10 do? That is an add roll. It means we get an additional attack, or attempt to attack anyway. Needing another nine, boom. All right, that would be a miss. So we get those three dice. Do we have any damage bonus, right? We are plus one to our range attack, but we are plus zero to our range damage. So all we would do is roll these three dice for damage. We're not adding anything to the roll. If there was a range bonus damage, let's say plus two, then you'd say, okay, I'm gonna add six to the roll. If you have trouble remembering that, put down a die. Oh, that would have been a nice one. Two add rolls. That gives us a total of 20. Right? 7 and 7 is 14, so we're at 34. Plus 6 is 40. 40 damage on the Crimson Legion. Now, we would ask ourselves, does the Crimson Legion have any defense... They themselves do not. However, their personality does. He has a defense too. That's going to automatically drop this down to 38. All right? That's important because every 10 points of damage is a wound. Now, let's look at the crab's hand. They have know the terrain which has a focus value of two. Counter charge, focus value of four. Parade gown practice, focus value of two. At this point as the attacker, they could say, hey, I really want to kill four guys. I think that might be a morale check. Uh, it's close. So I'm going to say counter charge. We're going to hold off on that. A lot of our units have uh, that ability already. I'm going to use this as a focus. 
put that in my discard pile, and that'll bring me back up to 42. Now, Scorpion, if you want to drop me back below four casualties, you're going to have to play a three focus card or greater. What does the Scorpion have in their hand? Blackmail. Turtle Shell. Oh, could have used that earlier. Forgot. And you dishonor your clan. So let's say I'm the Scorpion. Okay, I want to save these. Should have, should have played my Turtle Shell, but uh, I didn't think they were going to roll that well on their first attempt. So, you know, maybe next time. But I'm going to hold on to these. By the way, these are closed information for the purpose of the demo. We're going to see what they have. Um, and that would make 42 because they're not going to play any defensive cards. So we'd come over here. We take our four card casualties off. Okay. And they would have lost four out of 24. All right. Which is one six. It's not 25%. It's not going to cause a check. But let's say they lost six out of 24. Now they've taken 25% casualties. What does that mean? Okay. We want to understand how morale checks work. Morale tests in the game are caused by triggers. And there's a nice list of them here. If you have more than one trigger, that's going to function as a modifier to the check. So here we see the unit has suffered casualties totaling 25% of its original numeric strength. Yes, it has. Has it suffered 50? No. 75? No. Did it suffer 25% of its current strength during a single phase other than close combat? Yes, it did. That would be a minus one. Now, there's a lot more here. We're not going to read through all of them right now, but I'm going to tell you that's the only one that's going to count. So we have two triggers. Two triggers means that the Crimson Legion will need to take a morale check, and they will be at a minus one to the roll. Okay, so let's see how that's going to work for them. They are morale value of six, but Marmo has a leadership of three. So he would bring them down to a three or better to make a morale check, but they're at a minus one because of the second trigger. So needing a four or better, let's see how they would do. That would be a fail, and they would become broken at this time. Now, if you're a character, sorry, it's these guys. <laughs> If your character had enough void, three, you could actually do a reroll and say, oh, we made it. Okay. Uh, you can also spend void ahead of time. We won't go into void right now, but I just wanted to tell you that that's a thing. Let's just say that they passed their check. Okay. That's all of our shooting. Oh, no, it's not our shooting. How about these bowmen? Yeah. Uh, it's pretty clear that the heat of house guard are the closest to them. There's eight of them. Bowmen have a 360-degree arc of fire, by the way. That unit has a 90-degree arc of fire. So if anybody's outside of the 90 degrees, um, and you actually measure it from individual, um, individual shooters, but in this case, it's not an issue. So these bowmen are going to have eight dice. Now, the Heat of House Guard, I can tell you, are a ATN of seven. They're going to be over... Half range, because they have a hunk of 12 slash 24. So anything over 12 is going to be long range. So that's minus 2. That brings it to 9. Uh, they move, so that brings it to 10. It can't get any higher than 10. Uh, and then they have a plus 1. So that's going to bring us back to 9s. There's 8 of them needing 9s. So early on... Hard to get, uh, you know, a lot of good shots going. You're looking for high numbers. All right. And this would be another case of basically no hits. Let's just say for the sake of argument, they got one hit. One hit on a crab is not great. So you're rolling for damage. They do have a plus one, though. So And they got an ad roll. Look at that. So they're at 11. They're in business. They're at a 15. Okay. Crab, you know, are about defense. They start as at the defense of three, and then Tampaco gives them a defense of four, so that's seven. So 15, but reduced by seven is eight. You're not going to cause a single wound. Are you going to take that, Scorpion? I don't think so. You're going to say, I don't think we're going to play Dishonor our clan anytime soon. 
Now it's back up to 10. What are you going to do, Crab? And he's going to say, mm, I want to hold on to these. You go ahead and do a wound to me. Now, these guys have two wounds apiece. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take a die. That's not a 10-sided die, so I won't get confused. And I'll say, look, they've got a wound on them. And that will not cause any kind of morale check for those guys. We've done our shooting. Now we would have close combat. Okay, so we're going to uh, pretend like we have close combat happening. Let's say we're in a future turn and the damned have come up onto the bridge. And let's say they have been engaged by the Black Cabal. Okay, so in the movement phase, you can make an engaging movement up to four inches. If you do, then you're just there. Now, units have the charge ability or the charge card. Um, they're going to go ahead and play that. And that's very important in this game because, again, your unit's generally not moving very far four inches each time. Um, so let's say we had the charge card in hand. This allows the unit to add plus four inches to their engaging move. If they already had the charge skill, like their lion, they get another plus four, so they'd be plus eight. If they engage the enemy unit, they gain plus one, plus one until the end of the turn. Okay. Um, and the way this game works is you would measure the, the, the distance, and if you hit at an angle, you're just going to close the gap as long as you're, uh, I believe it's 30 degrees or more, or less. So he's going to play the charge card. And the Black Cabal crashes in. Now, you might think, oh, well, um, those are crab, aren't they? Yeah. What would the crab do if they were charged? They might counter charge. But these guys have Stalwart Defender. They don't have a personality. And what does Stalwart Defender do? When commanded by a leader with a Stalwart Defender skill, so they don't have a personality, but they do have a Crab Chewy, which is a leadership package, a lieutenant then they will enter the engagement as a defender. They gain plus one attack until the end of the turn. So we can remember, these guys have a plus one attack, and these guys are plus one, plus one. So we're in close combat. How do we determine what happens here? It's going to be simultaneous. Uh, unless somebody has spears, which have first strike in the first round of combat, we're going to roll the attacks for both sides. In the first round of combat, you only get the front rank of each side. So for the Black Cabal, we're going to get one die for each of the normal dudes. And then we're going to go see what the deal for Aramoro is. He's kind of a tough dude. He's got two strikes, and he's plus two, plus two. So we'll do him separately, because he's very different from the rest of them. Um, the Black Cabal themselves are plus one, plus one to start. This turn they charge, so they'll be plus two, plus two. They are fighting the damned, who are at ATN of seven. So they're going to need fives. So we're going to roll these, and they need fives to hit. Whoa, that was a good roll. So they missed one, but they got an ad roll, two ad rolls. They're going to end up with four. And we'll go ahead and do their damage now, because they're plus two. So it's one, two, three, four. So it's plus eight to the damage just to start. I'm putting that there as a reminder. Okay. Oh, not a great damage roll. 4, 7, 15, plus 8, 23. Now, we're not going to apply defense or anything yet because we have to do our moral. He's a plus 2, plus 2, but he also charged, making him plus 3, plus 3. There are 7. That means he needs 4s. So he's different. We're going to do him 4s. And he whiffed, but let's say he hit. He hits with 1, plus 3 to the damage roll. So we're adding three to this. That would be four, not great. So that would bring it to 27. Okay, now what's the crab's defense? We know it's usually pretty good. The damned have defense three. That'll only bring it to 24. That's not gonna stop the casualty. Uh, you know, just for the sake of everybody who knows this game, uh, once per turn while engaged, total wounds suffered during the close, close combat phase are reduced by one. So the damned would actually only suffer one wound here, because they're the damned. But let's pretend they're not the damned, just showing you what I did 27. 
a unit would take two. Okay, now they would attack back. They countercharged. Um, let's pretend they do not have a hero in them. I think that's actually a hero figure, but I didn't put a hero in the unit in terms of the army list. They're plus one, plus one, and they countercharge. So they're plus two, plus one. Five dice. They're going to attack the unit. Aramoro cannot be attacked separately unless there's a duel um, or some other special effect. So we're just going to attack the unit. There's sevens. So we are plus two, plus one, plus two, meaning we will need fives to hit these guys. And we'll add one to the damage roll for every hit. All right, we only got two hits. So we're going to add two because we're adding one to the damage roll, we're adding two to this roll. We did get an add roll. Okay, so we got 16, 17, 19. We would only kill one. Black Cabal. Okay, now, unlike some other games you may have seen, this does not mean that the um, Black Cabal have won and the Damned have to take a check. Both sides could take checks depending on the results. All right, and in this case, just like as always, we would go down the morale test list and see if any of the triggers apply. In this case, um, I don't think any, any of the triggers apply. Nobody took 25% of their original strength or more. Nobody suffered 25% of their current strength during and was outnumbered by at least two to one during the close combat phase. Or 25% of current strength and caused fewer wounds than received. Okay, and they were not outnumbered four to one. Okay, so uh, if a commander's removed as a casualty, that's, by the way, dueling can be very bad because you killed the commander, then the unit has to take a check. Okay, um, in this case, there would be no checks. They would stay and they would keep fighting. In subsequent phases, let's just take off the casualties. In subsequent phases, you get two dice for each additional rank. So the Black Cabal are going to have, and an additional rank has to have at least four units. So the Black Cabal are going to get six additional dice in addition to their front rank. The Damned are only get two additional dice because they are down to three in the back rank. And they would roll all that dice, and then they would do their casualties. And at that point, we would probably start to see checks. Now, let's just say for the sake of argument, the Damned did take enough casualties. They started with 15. So let's say they took five. Sorry about that, bro. So let's say they took five, and now they they took a morale check. And we know they're the damned, so they're really they're really good. But let's say they rolled a one. I've seen this happen. Uh, I've seen a Kodo Death Seekers roll a one, which is really sad because they have like a two plus morale. They rolled a one. They failed. Okay, I'm gonna take out a marker. And I'm going to say, okay, you guys are broken. How is a broken unit handled? So what's going to happen is they're not going to run away immediately. They're going to next movement phase. They're going to try to run away. And if they do run away, this unit will have the option, depending on their initiative order, this unit will have the option of either taking free swings at them or waiting and trying to charge them. Okay. Also... This is important in this game. Uh, a friendly routed unit, oh, sorry, friendly unit within eight inches became broken routed. Oh man. If a friendly unit within eight inches became broken routed or was destroyed, removed to the last model just during the current phase, units with a morale level of five or less ignore this trigger. So that is a trigger, right? Um, and in this case, let's just say this unit had a morale of six. These guys are within eight inches and they became routed in the current phase or broken in the current phase, they would have to check. Just a single trigger, unless something else applied. So in this case, you know, they're they're probably, let's say they're a six and he's a three, and you're three or better, or something like that. They'd be okay. However, they could fail. If they failed and there was another unit near them, it could cascade to them. So cascading morale is a thing in this game. You have to be careful of that. It's good to have morale level five units in place to stop that from happening. Okay, and that's basically close combat. You can have multiple engagements, in which case, you know, you want to treat 
you treat it as one big combat. Let's say somehow these guys got across the side and engaged them across the side there. We would treat this as one big combat. We would look at the total number for outnumbering purposes. Now, getting hit in the flank is very serious. Um, I just want to mention that. When you're hit in the flank, when you're engaged in the front, that constitutes an immediate morale check. And then while you are flanked, uh, you have minus one to all your rolls, and you cannot use your abilities, which is a big deal. Um, and then if you are attacking into the flank of an enemy, you get plus one, plus one. In addition, they would lose their flank attacks. These guys touching them could fight this way, and these guys in the front could fight either this way or if this guy is touching that way, but they do not get their rank bonus anymore either. So being flanked is disastrous in this game. You really want to avoid it. Now, after the close combat phase is over, and we've done all the close combats, you can resolve them in any order you want. The triggers all apply simultaneously to the units at the end of the turn. Once we finish the close combat phase, we go to the reserve movement phase. Any units did not perform any kind of attack during the turn and are not within 12 inches of enemy unit may perform reserve movement. No free maneuvers are allowed during this phase and a unit may not initiate an engagement during reserve movement. So, for example, over here, let's say this flank was still delayed. These guys are not within 12 in the reserve movement phase. They could move again. If they wanted to do something like uh, wheel or turn or expand their ranks, they would have to go ahead and make a maneuver test like we walked in, uh, walked through before. No free maneuvers in the reserve movement phase. These guys, let's say they're not within 12, they would shift up as well. And then, of course, that's where initiative could be a thing because if they were to wander within 12 of them before they activated, then they wouldn't be able to make their reserve movement phase. But in this case, they would say, okay, we're going to go try to face them down. After the reserve movement phase is over, there's the end phase. In the end phase, you accumulate victory points, you attempt to rally, rally broken units, and you draw and discard tactical cards. Then you collect your initiative dice and exchange the hand of fate. So if you have a broken unit, it cannot attempt to rally the turn that it broke. They would have to have tried to get away, maybe. And if they were far enough away and eligible to rally, they could roll to rally. Uh, that's difficult to deal with in this game um, because you, uh, in order to rally, um, you have to be far enough away uh, from the enemy that you um, are able to do that. And then you're already at a minus two because of your broken status. And then if you're successful, you don't get a free reform. You're stuck that way. So your next turn, assuming you live this long, you would have to spend your turn, you could do an about face, and then try to move back to the engagement. So uh, becoming broken or routed, routed basically means you're off the table, absent the play of a special card or very special ability, uh, general routed units. Uh, once you're broken, if you take another check and you fail, you become routed. Uh, routed units flee the table. They're not immediately picked up and removed like in some more modern designs. Uh, they are kept on the table to do their running away. And then with cards, so you are uh, have a maximum of five cards in hand. You draw cards. Let's say the turn has now ended. Okay. Uh, we're going to... We don't usually pick them all up, but you know, you're going to redo initiative. The Hand of Fate... Uh, is going to exchange hands, right? So I've got two cards as the scorpion. Everybody gets to draw one card. If you have the highest honor, you get to draw another card. In this case, that would be the crab. Uh, scorpions start with very low honor. And if you have any tacticians in your army, you draw an additional card. The most you can draw is three. So in this case, the scorpion would draw one. The crab would draw two. You can draw more than five, but you have to immediately discard back down to five. Okay. Um, again, I think I didn't walk through these too much in this uh, demonstration of the game, but this is a tactics card. Uh, it tells you when it can be played in the bold area here. Range attack, offensive reaction, 
this is all or nothing, for example, when a unit is shooting, you can use this card following all the rules in it and get plus two, plus two. Afterwards, you become spent. Uh, when you become spent in this game, your unit becomes basically combat ineffective. You turn the guys sideways here. They're not running away. They're not broken, which you can just kind of like disorder the front. And they're spent. And it takes one full turn. So in this case, let's say they were, let's say they were a shooting unit and they used all or nothing. Uh, the next time you would have a chance to unspend, become unspent, is in the command phase. Uh, sorry, the special actions phase. But you have to have spent one full turn spend before you can do that. So as you can see in the sequence, special actions, see it's called return to duty. Special actions phase happens before range attack. So if I become spent in range attack, I go through all these phases back to range attack before I'm eligible. So it's going to be the turn after next that they would be able to return to duty. So say this turn they shot using that card, they become spent. Next turn, they're going to stay spent all through the turn. And they will not return to duty till the following turn, special actions phase. So becoming spent is a big deal. There's a lot of effects in the game that give you big bonuses for becoming spent. Um, so you've really got to think tactically. Like maybe I'm willing to do it with these archers because they're really far away. And I don't think anyone's going to get to them for two turns. And this is the last chance they're going to have before those guys charge. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to do and I'll play all or nothing on them and just deal with the fact that they're spent. Um, so that's what being spent would, would do. So after you draw your cards, exchange the hand of fate. Any tiebreakers are now going to be resolved by the Crab Clan. And you're going to start the turn again. We've drawn our new cards. We're going to re-roll all our initiative. We'll go back to doing our special order, special actions, primary movement, cavalry movement, ranged attacks, close combat, reserve movement, and the end phase. And that is basically how you play Clan War. So let me know in the comments if you have any questions, uh, anything that I said that was wrong and you want to let everybody know. And I'm happy to be corrected. I do have a battle report that I'm working on, uh, editing up. It's taking a while because it's a little bit more complex than these one-shots. But uh, with the battle reports coming, hopefully you'll see more of the game in action, the kind of decisions that people have to make, uh, and the crazy hijinks uh, that occur when you roll lots of tens uh, in an attack phase, uh, and all of the other exciting stuff that can happen when you use all the special abilities, magic, and dirty tricks available to the armies of Rokugan. So thanks again for joining me on the Ludomancer's Vault. Uh, remember, please, to like and subscribe for more content, and we will see you on the battlefield.